Well, good afternoon. I'm glad you uh, could make it here, and uh, your pastor is a lot more awake today, so that's handy and helpful. I'm not feeling sick like it was last week, but uh, praise God, I'm doing better. So um, let's stand and greet those folks around us and uh, as we worship. Let's stand as we have uh, begin with our opening versicles printed in our bulletin. This is the day which the Lord has made. From the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Prepare the way of the Lord. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. From the rising of the sun to its setting, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated for our first hymn.
The first reading is from Hebrews chapter 9. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer, heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Romans chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. He shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. This is the name by which he will be called. Lord. Let's review together now the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against me. You shall not have your Covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Let us confess our faith now with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn.
And let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord my God. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're still in the third week of Advent, and uh, we know that, uh, you know, the last couple of Wednesdays we've been looking at those three key words at the end of our, our text from 1 Corinthians 9, uh, washed, sanctified, justified. So today is our last Wednesday, and uh, we're going to look at justified. So if you want to follow along, um, I'm looking at the text from Romans chapter 3. It's on page 797 in your pew Bible, Romans 3, beginning at verse 21. Again, it's 97. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice, because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now, we talked about this uh, some weeks back, about justified is just as if I had not sinned. And I think that's this key part. I mean, that's kind of a key summary of uh, um, even from our text here. So, of course, one, that, this isn't the only one we're going to look at, but one of the key ones uh, from this text right off the bat is um, here in verse um, 22. Um, it says uh, at the end of 22, there's no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So that's kind of one of right there. To me, that's like a good summary of the, of the gospel. I mean, of the law and gospel right there, okay? Because every single person beginning of time until now and until Christ returns, every single person born into sin and in sin did our mothers conceive us. We know that is a fact, okay? No matter what some people might say, there's not a waiting room. There's not like a bus station terminal. There's no in-between plays that you just can go hang out for all eternity, okay? Um, I mean, that might be joyful, but there are two places, okay? And it's either in the presence of God or in the absence of God. So that's, that's the two places, all right? And uh, of course, you know, some people don't like to know that that, but you know what? Scripture is clear. It's very clear this is how Scripture works. It's, my job here is not to make Scripture say something else. Okay, that's just twisting Scripture, and that's where heresy and all sorts of uh, fortunate things come around. Uh, but Paul here is quoting uh, uh, from, uh, from Psalm 14 and 53, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Not even Mother Teresa. Not even the sweet old lady in the pew next to you. Not any kind neighbor. Okay? Because, I remember saying this before, um, this is a good example in our church, in any church, not just Emmanuel. Okay? That sweet old lady is sweet and kind until you sit in her pew. Okay, and then you're going to see the ugliness of sin just pop right out, unfortunately. So, but, okay, all of sin. But what's wonderful then, the, the, so that's the law, the first part of, of verse 23, 22 and 23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And then the next part, which is the gospel, which is the, the glorious part, all are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So to me, this is, this is, this is the wonderful summary of, of, of the scriptures. If you ever, you know, just want to know kind of what the short and sweet, pull this one out right here, okay? Romans 3, 22 and 23 and 24. Pull those out. That's it, okay? Because it's summarized very clearly. We know the law. Its job is to show us our sin. That's it, all right? The gospel shows us. The law also shows us what, what God is going to do, 
Okay, the gospel also then shows us God's action and his work in our lives, and they go together, okay? I remember years ago having this discussion with someone. Unfortunately, he grew up in a, well, I say unfortunately, fortunately, he grew up in a Christian church, and I don't remember which one it was. Um, might have been slightly Baptist, whatever, but I say unfortunate because then he married someone who was Mormon, and then they became Mormon, so that, you know, and then he had this whole different unfortunate idea about Scripture, and I remember thinking, but you grew up and you were taught in your church the truth of God's word. And then he married uh, this lady who was Mormon, and then he became Mormon. And then he was convinced everything that he had learned was wrong. And I thought, well, okay, you can believe that, but the scriptures are still the same. If I'm a Christian today, become a Muslim tomorrow, the scriptures are still the same, right? It doesn't change. Just because my attitude changes or my ideas change, all right? Anyway, so all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely, just as if we had not sinned freely by God's grace through Jesus Christ's redemption, through the redemption that comes through Christ Jesus, through Jesus' substitution on that cross so that you and I don't have to be on that, God, on that cross. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now, this text right here, I've had some discussions with even with fellow Christians about this passage here, and it can sound like God didn't forgive the sins of the people in the Old Testament. And that's not at all true. Okay. We've talked about the forgiveness of sins that was received by faith through God's grace in the sacrificial system of Leviticus. Woohoo! Thanks. Thanks. That makes me happy, really, it does. I, I want to be that church where, you know, the oddball church, like, they get excited about Leviticus, because why not, okay? We Lutherans have a lot of weirdness about us, so let's just add that one to our, our little, uh, okay? So, we learned how God's grace is present in the sacrificial system, okay? But Paul here is, is reminding the Christians at Rome that that system was not perfect, which we know. The sacrificial system was not perfect, okay? But that God, in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, he knows how this is, okay? Okay? He could have had Jesus come back in the days when the Israelites were wandering in the desert. I mean, he could have. He didn't. Okay, but he, he could have. Okay, but he didn't. He set up the sacrificial system, and we could see God's grace in that system. The system was not perfect because it's not. Because it's not perfect. I always think of it, it wasn't perfect because God has, has uh, you know, created us and we have all been born into sin and we all live in a sin-filled world. And God created a system that was, a, that, that was for us, okay? That sacrificial system was for us, okay? It's not for God because God doesn't need it. He doesn't need the... To, for me to shed the blood of a, a goat or a ram or a lamb or anything, all right? So it's not perfect because it's not, it's not Christ, all right? But Paul here points out, he says that he did this to demonstrate, the, uh, shedding, uh, demonstrate his righteousness. God demonstrated his righteousness because in his foreknowledge, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies the, those who have faith in Jesus. Because the only person that could fulfill God's law completely was Christ. It was not the blood of goats or rams or, or, or doves or pigeons or grain. They're just animals. They're just grain that we use, that we have, right? I mean, that's, it's not, it's not going to fulfill it because it's not perfect, but Christ is, okay? So, God forgives the sins of all people of all time through Christ. Okay? He did not ignore sin. 
This one, one kind of commentary here that was saying, the sins that were committed all throughout the history of the Old Testament since the beginning of time, God simply delayed the punishment, the final punishment, until Christ paid for every one of those sins with his own horrible suffering, awful death, and victorious resurrection from the dead. So Christ has fulfilled all of that. I mean, we even see, Jesus even says this, like when he goes and gets baptized by John, you know, John's like, I need to be baptized by you. And what are you doing coming to me, Jesus? And Jesus says that this is to fulfill all righteousness. This is to fulfill everything, the law and the prophets and everything. Because John himself is just John. He's just a man, okay? He was a guy set apart by all the other prophets, of, you know, from the Old Testament up until that point and set apart to preach and teach the truth of God's word. And that was it. But it's Christ who is fulfilling this completely. So we know, you know, we know that that sacrificial system in Leviticus was not perfect, okay? And Hebrews, the author of Hebrew talks about this here. This was our, our, our first reading. Jesus entered once for all into the holy places by means of blood and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify, that is, make holy, for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You know, and elsewhere Hebrews talks a little more about this, that, you know, if... if if I, if I can fulfill God's law by simply cutting the, you know, slitting the throat of the, of the lamb or the goat and then offering it up according on, you know, on the altar, according to the Levitical instructions, then who cares about Jesus, right? What's the point? Why do we need Jesus then? Well, we, we need him, okay? Because we know that that system isn't, is, is broke. I mean, it's, it's not a perfect system. It's not broken. It's just, it's not a perfect system. Because that's what our, our writer here says in Hebrews. If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes sanctify, how much more will the blood of Christ with, uh, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So we know that it's Jesus who is the one who fulfills the entire law. He fulfills. I mean, he is the word. That's in Greek. The word is the, the Greek word is word, is logos, which means the word, okay? He's the word, and uh, so he is fulfilling, you know, what come out of him, what the Spirit, you know, inspired men to write these words down that Jesus himself, this Holy Spirit himself, uh, them prompted uh, those men to write down so that they then can you know, put that information down so that we can then, future people can learn the truth of God's word. They can learn the truth about Jesus. We can know that we are justified by God's grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. And that, that we are made holy and whole and righteous by Jesus' work in us, by the Spirit working in us. That's what, that's what happens, you know, that's what happens at our baptism. That's what our text, I'll reread this text, our kind of our theme text from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then Paul goes on to be very specific. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. sanctified by the work, ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. We are justified by the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as we you know, move through this Advent season and prepare for, to receive, uh, to celebrate rather, the, the birth of our Savior, this is a perfect opportunity to be reminded, of course, of what God's done for us and how he continues to work in us 
but also then how, you know, once we fell into that truth, how God gives us opportunities to go out and share that bit of nugget of truth. Because somebody, somebody probably needs to hear the truth right now. And God is equipping us, all of us. So I don't know, you know what situation God's going to put you in, but I do know that God is equipping us all the time, pouring the truth into us so that we can then pour that nugget of truth out to somebody else. That's, that's part of the being and uh, sharing the hope we have in Christ. So that more people will see Jesus and see the works that Jesus created in you and give glory to God our Heavenly Father. Let's praise Lord our God for all his benefits to us. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Let all who seek the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He recalls his promises and leads his people forth in joy with shouts of thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Now, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds on the one true faith of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. So what that means is, if you want to listen and hear, you better go far. If you want to hear, otherwise, you want to stay in the back of the thing. I can only shout so loudly, though. Know. Please rise up to continue with our response to prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of the divine peace and pardon with all our hearts and with all our minds, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and calling of all the faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, for the commonwealth, for us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For seasonable weather, for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphan, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the sick and the dying, for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Finally, for these and all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy.
Spirit of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.